Throughout history, the story of the Indians and British has always been one that left most people with several grey areas. And you wonder why that is. For starters, one of the very first Indian words to enter the English language was the Hindustani slang for plunder, loot. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word was uncommon outside the plains of North India until the late 18th century, when it suddenly became a common term in Britain. To really understand why that word became widespread in a distant landscape, we need to look back at the story of the British conquering India. Contrary to that, it wasn't the British government who conquered India, but a dangerously unregulated private company known as the East India Company, headquartered in a tiny office, five windows wide in London and managed in India by unstable sociopath Clive. So brace yourselves as we get ready to head to England in the 15th century, where it all began to tell the story of the East Indian Company and how it conquered Asia. And to create your own East India Company. It all began in 1577, when the famous English explorer Francis Drake set out on one of his expeditions from England to Spain, with the hope of plundering Spanish settlement in South America in search for silver and gold. After sailing in the Golden Hinds, he accomplished his mission and sailed across the Pacific Ocean in 1579. At the time, the Pacific Ocean was only known to the Portuguese and Spanish, but Francis Drake eventually sailed to the East Indies, where he came across the Moluccas, which was also known as the Spice Islands. There he met Sultan Babullah and exchanged for silver gold and linen. Drake got a large haul of exotic spices, including cloves and nutmeg. In 1580, Drake sailed back to England as a hero with his circumnavigation, raising a large amount of money for officers in England and starting an important element in Eastern design. During the late 16th century, after the Spanish Armada defeated in 1588, the captured Portuguese and Spanish ship cargo allowed the English voyagers to go around the globe searching for riches, a move that changed everything. As a result, Several merchants in London made a petition to Queen Elizabeth I, seeking permission to set sail for the Indian Ocean, with the aim of delivering a final and decisive blow to the Far Eastern trade monopoly run by the Portuguese and Spanish. In 1591, Queen Elizabeth I eventually gave the permission, and James Lancaster, in company with two ships paid for by the Levin Company, began to sail from England around the Cape of Good Hope to the Arabian Sea becoming the first English expedition to reach India that way. Before he returned to England in 1594, James Lancaster sailed around Cape Camorin to the Malay Peninsula and preyed on Portuguese and Spanish ships. The biggest victory that rocked the English trade was when the large Portuguese carac, the Madre de Deus, was seized by Sir Walter Raleigh and the Earl of Cumberland during the Battle of Flores in August 1592. When the ship arrived in Dartmouth, it was the largest vessel England had ever seen, and she carried chests of pearls, jewels, silver coins, gold cloth, ambergins, pepper, tapestries, cloves, cinnamon, red dye and more. The ship's rudder or mariner handbook was equally valuable as it contained vital information on India, China and Japan trade routes. After the success, three more ships sailed to the east, but all ended up lost in the sea until 1957, when Rolf Fitch arrived. He was an adventurer merchant who, alongside his companions, had gone on a remarkable nine-year overland journey to Mesopotamia, the Persian Gulf, the Indian Ocean and the Southeast. Fitch was consulted on Indian affairs and gave even more valuable information to Lancaster. By 1599, plans had already started coming together to make a potential East Indies ventures under a royal charter. A group of prominent merchants including Fitch, Lancaster, Stephen Soame, and then Lord Mayor of London, and Thomas Smithy, an influential London politician and administrator who had established the Levin Company. In September of that year, the group stated their interest in venturing onto the pretended voyage of the East Indies and investing around £30,000, which is over four million in today's money. Two days later, the group met again and decided to approach the Queen for support of the project. However, their initial approach wasn't successful so they sought the Queen's unofficial approval to continue. By December 1600, Queen Elizabeth finally granted the group a royal charter to trade with countries of the Eastern Hemisphere. And by doing so, the Honourable Company of Merchants of London, trading with the East Indies, 
or East India Company, as it later became known was founded. At that time, very few people would have predicted the enormous shift in the dynamics of global trade and dominance that would follow. Nor that 258 years later, the company would gain control of a subcontinent to the British crown and conquer Asia. This was the beginning of how the company gained and consolidated its power across Asia. For a period of 15 years after the Queen granted the group its charter, the company gained the monopoly on English trade, with all countries located east of the Cape of Good Hope and west of the Straits. As such, any trade without a license from the company was unable to conduct business and stood at risk of losing their cargo and ships as well as imprisonment at the royal pleasure. In 1601, the first India Company voyage was commanded by Sir James Lancaster, and by the following year, while sailing in Malacca Straits, he took the rich 1-200-ton Portuguese carrack South Home carrying pepper and spices, which allowed voyagers to establish two factories located at Bantam on Java and in the Moluccas. By the time they returned to England in 1603, they learned that Queen Elizabeth had died. However, the new king knighted Lancaster due to the voyage's success at the time the war with Spain ended, and the company had made a profitable breach in the Spanish Portuguese Dupoli that opened up new horizons for the English. At the time when Queen Elizabeth I signed the East India Company, otherwise known as EIC, into existence in 1600, her counterpart in India, the Mughal Emperor Akbar, was ruling a large empire that spanned over 750,000 square miles, from northern Afghanistan in the northwest to central Indian Stakhan Plateau in the south and the Assamese highlands in the northeast. During that period, the Mughal Empire had entered the century of centralized solid power and was filled with dominance from the military and cultural productivity that marketed the rule of the great Mughals. Its court had so much wealth and magnificence capable of overshadowing anything Europe could produce at the time, as Indians' natural produce and its artisans were coveted around the world. When the East India Company first made its visit to the Mughal court at the start of the 17th century, they came as supplicants, trying to negotiate good trading relations with Akbar's successors, Emperor Jihangir. The EIC had originally planned to make attempts at forcing their way into the booming spice market, but later found out it was dominated by the Dutch. So James instructed Sir Thomas Rowe to visit the Emperor and negotiate a commercial treaty that would give the East India Company exclusive rights to stay and open factories in Surat and other areas. In return for this gesture, the company would provide the Emperor with food and rarities from different European markets. The mission was highly successful and Jahangir sent a letter to James through Sir Thomas Rowe. After his permission, the East India Company started building small bases and factories on the western and eastern coasts of India. From these coastal toeholds, the company operated and ran its profitable trades in textile, spices and luxury goods, which saw massive successes. The operation included business dealings with Indian artisans and producers, majorly through Indian middlemen. Through the 17th and 18th century, the company continued to grow in size and influence while its shares, although volatile, became an important leader of the British economy. And the company emerged as one of London's most powerful financial institutions. However, all these happened with a little bit of fortune. The rapid rise of the East India Company was aided by the catastrophic decline of the Mughals in the 18th century. In 1739, when Robert Clive, who later became the military leader of the EIC, was only 14 years old, the Mughals were still ruling the large empire stretching from Kabul to Madras. However, in the same year, a Persian adventurer by the name of Nader Shah attacked the Khyber Pass with just 150,000 of his cavalry men and defeated the Mughal army that totaled an astonishing 1.5 million men. Three months after the event, Nader Shah returned to Persia, bringing with him the best treasures the Mughal Empire had collected and amassed in its over 200 years of several conquests. A caravan of riches that included Shah Jan's magnificent peacock throne, the Koh I Noor, the largest diamond in the world, as well as its sister, the Darya Noor, and 700 elephants, 4,000 camels, and 12,000 horses, carrying wagons, all laden with gold, silver, and precious stones, worth an estimated 87.5 million pounds in the currency of the time. The loot would later end up being more valuable than the one later extracted by Clive from the peripheral province of Bengal. Ultimately, the destruction of the Mughal power by Nader Shah and the subsequent removal of its financing funds led to the empire crumbling. The same year, the French Compagnie des Indes started to produce its own minted coins, and soon, 
without any authority to regulate or stop them. The French and English were drilling Indian soldiers serving under them and materializing their operations. With its operation in India growing more prominent, it wasn't long before the East India Company was straddling the globe. It almost single-handedly reversed the trade balance, which from the time of the Romans had led to a continuous drain of the western Balian eastwards, as the East India Company further aimed to conquer the country and increase its monopoly, it shipped Chinese tea to Massachusetts in the West, where its dumping in Boston Harbor caused the American War of Independence. By the time the East India Company captured the Mughal capital of Delhi, it had already privately trained up a security force of 250,000 men, a figure twice the size of the entire British Army of the time. Its security force also marshaled more firepower than any other nation of all Asia setting a precedent for more terror to come. Despite initially being a junior partner in the sophisticated commercial network of the Mughal Empire, the East India Company later became increasingly involved in subcontinental politics in the 18th century. The company struggled to hold its trading privileges as the Mughal authority declined and dynamic individual successor state began to emerge. Several competitors from Europe also started having an increased presence in the subcontinent. France was particularly noted for its growing presence as a major national and imperial rival during the War of Austrian Succession and the Seven Years' War. As a result, the strategic importance of the East India Company's foothold in India increased, and the country's coastline became a vital instrument in further expansion in all of Asia and some areas of Africa. One of the major turning points for the infamous East India Company's transformation from a trading company with huge profits to a full-fledged empire came shortly after the 1757 Battle of Palasi. The battle pitted 50,000 Indian soldiers under the Nawab of Bengal against just 3,000 company men. The Nawab of Bengal was angry because the EIC was evading taxes. However, the Nawab didn't know what the East India Company's military leader in Bengal, Robert Clive, had already agreed on behind-the-door deal with Indian bankers so that the majority of the Indian army would refuse to fight at Palasi. Clive's victory gave the East India Company's broad taxation powers in Bengal, which was then one of the wealthiest provinces in India. Clive plundered the Nawab's treasure and shipped it back to London. After the battle at Palasi in 1757, a victory that owed more to treachery, forged contracts, bankers and bribes than military prowess, Clive transferred to the EIC treasury no less than 2.5 million pounds seized from the defeated rulers of Bengal. In today's currency, around 23 million pounds for Clive and 250 million pounds for the company. The East India Company was then granted control over the administration of the region and power to collect tax revenue. During that period, the company further expanded its influence over all rulers in Southern Asia until the 1770s. When the balance of power had fundamentally changed, however, the expansion continued, and rivals such as the Maratha people in western India and Tipu, Sultan of Mysore, were defeated. At the start of the 19th century, the East India Company became a force to reckon in political power affairs in India. It had direct control over two-thirds of the subcontinent entire landmass and indirect control over the rest. During its early years of ruling the subcontinent, the East India Company was infamous for its profiteering and corruption and even more notorious for the so-called shaking of the pagoda tree or rape of Bengal. Employees of the East India Company or Nabobs, as they were derisively dubbed, gathered large fortunes for themselves at the expenses of their Indian subjects. However, during the late 18th century, there was a development of what eventually became the basics of the East India Company state in India. As several traders wanted to become administrators and create system of rule that were compatible with their Georgian ideas of political economy and specific circumstances in India. One factor that was detrimental in East India Company's plan in Asia was the large population and sophisticated social, economic and political institutions of India. It made the imperialistic ideas of Terra Nullius inapplicable and as a result, the East India Company could not achieve the level or control over the resources of the land and labor that characterized British settler communities in Canada, Australia, New Zealand and Cape and the Caribbean. India was simply a colony of exploitation to the India East Company rather than an area of settlement. Its value was primarily in the profits that could be made by essentially controlling the country's internal markets and international trade, appropriating peasant production and, above all, collecting tax revenue. 
These taxes paid for both the large standing army and sizable cadre of the AIC employees and covenanted civil servants who worked in India but did not ultimately settle there. Any time they felt like the East India Company utilized its legal separation from the government by arguing forcefully and successfully that the document had previously signed by Shah Alam, known as Diwani, was the company's legal property, not the crown. Despite the government spending a large sum on the military and naval operations protecting the East India Company acquisitions, unsurprisingly, the MPs who were part of the voting process to uphold the legal distinction weren't exactly neutral. In fact, almost a quarter of them privately held company stocks, which would have declined in value had the crown taken over. So for the same reason, the MPs needed to protect the company from any foreign competition became a major aim of British foreign policy. The East India Company's exploit did not end in India alone. During one of its darkest chapters, the EIC was involved in the smuggling of opium into China in exchange for the country's widely renowned tea. Despite China only trading tea for silver, the company took advantage of China's opium ban through a black market in Indian opium growers and smugglers, so they started selling high-grade opium to several Chinese merchants towards the end of the 18th century. The sales caused an astronomical rise in cases of opioid addiction outbreak in China at the start of the 19th century. While China suffered, the East India Company investors get richer as tea kept growing in London. At the time, the ruling Qing dynasty decided to crack down on the use of opium by outlawing the trade. But the British merchants throughout the East India Company continued to smuggle in the products illegally. The Qing took measures to prevent the East India Company from selling opium and destroyed tens of thousands of chests of opium already in the country. In retaliation to this move from the Chinese, the British government sent several warships to attack the Chinese coast over several months. These events marked the start of the 1840 Opium War, which ended in victory for the British, giving them control of Hong Kong. As part of the Treaty of Nanjing in 1842, the Qing were forced to give the British merchants special treatment and the right to sell opium. This conflict is one of many that shed further light on the East India Company's dark dealings in their conquest of Asia. In 1857, the Indian Rebellion began in an attempt to push back the East India Company, controlled by the British. The rebellion was majorly fueled by the hatred born out of the different views, including the British-style social reforms, which were invasive in nature. The harsh taxes on land, summary treatment received by some princes and rich landowners, as well as the doubts about the alleged improvement the British rule brought, several Indians rose up against the British. However, many of them also fought their countrymen for the British, while the majority remained obedient to the British rule. During the period of the uprising, which lasted from 1857 to 1858, both sides experienced exceptional cruelty. British soldiers, civilians, women, children, rebels and all their supporters all suffered ill fates. In the end, under the provisions of the Government of India Act 1858, the British government eventually nationalized the company and took over all its possessions in India, its machinery, armed forces and administrative powers. At the time, the company had already rid itself of its commercial trading assets in India in favor of the UK government in 1833, who later assumed in debt and obligations of the company, which were to be serviced and paid from the tax revenue raised in India. In return, the company's shareholders voted to accept the annual dividend of 10.5%, guaranteed for a duration of 40 years, likewise to be funded from India, with a final payoff to redeem outstanding shares. The debt obligation continued beyond the solution and were only extinguished by the UK government during the Second World War. The East India Company continued to exist in a very small capacity, managing the tea trade on behalf of the British government until the East India Stock Dividend Redemption Act 1873 came into effect, which happened on January 1, 1874. This act provided the former dissolution of the company on 1 June 1874 after a final dividend payment and the commutation or redemption of its stock. Even though the East India Company dissolved more than a century ago, its influence as the ruthless corporate pioneer has shaped the way modern business is conducted in a global economy. Regardless of its brutality, the East India Company was the perfect model of a corporate efficiency. After about 100 years of existence, it had only 35 people as permanent employees in its head office. However, that small number of staff carried out what till today is regarded as a corporate coup unparalleled in history. The military subjugation, conquest and plunder of several tracts of Southern Asia, its brutal act which lasted centuries, remains the greatest act of corporate violence in world history.
Despite the power wielded today by some of the world's largest corporations like Google, ExxonMobil or Walmart, they're all tame beasts when compared with the ravaging territorial atrocities and conquer appetite of the East India Company. As Emily Erickson, a sociology professor at Yale University notes, it's hard to understand the global political structure without understanding the role of the company. I don't think we'd have a global capitalist economist that looked the way that it does if England hadn't become so uniquely powerful at that point in history. They transitioned into a modern industrial force and exported their vision of production and governance to the rest of the world, including North America. It is the cornerstone of the modern liberal global political order. If you enjoyed watching this video, do leave a like and subscribe to this channel for more interesting stories and hidden secrets about your favorite companies, families and people.